Our Torah on this week's Perashah talks about the construction of the Mishkan, the tabernacle. Basically, the Mishkan is a portable synagogue. It traveled with the Jewish people throughout their journey in the Midbar. It also accompanied them into Eris Israel until the first Bet HaMikdash was built. Of course, the Bet HaMikdash is a permanent structure. The Mishkan was not a free uh, project. It cost money to build the Mishkan. And the donations were solicited by the Jewish people. By Moshe to the Jewish people. Uh, people that were generous donated, of course, the precious metals like gold and silver. Others that were less generous donated the less precious items like the Nechoshet. Altogether there were 13 different raw materials that were needed in the construction of the Mishkan. And as we know... The Mishkan was a very successful campaign in that all the money was raised. Uh, it is the uh, first and last time in history that a campaign was called off by the solicitor announcing that we have enough funds. I will make a, uh, 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 a non-official vow in the synagogue that that will never happen again. The sun might set at 12 o'clock in the afternoon but a solicitor will never say that uh, we have enough money, the campaign is successful. For some reason, uh, you could always use more. There's always something to do with the extra money. That being said, Moshe Rabbeinu was ish emet. He wasn't looking to shake down the Jewish people. And once they collected enough money, he says, uh, you know, that's it. That's, uh, we've reached our quota. So that's definitely uh, a novel item. Our rabbis question the juxtaposition between Parashat Teruman and Parashat Mishpatim. Uh, you know, our Torah, you're allowed to ask that question. Why does Parashat Teruman find itself uh, neighboring Parashat Mishpatim? Uh, you can't ask that question about the New York Times. How come uh, the article about Bosnia neighbors the article about uh, Basra? Just because, uh, you know, that's the way the old gray ladies, editors decided to print it. There's no connection between the two, uh, the two articles. In Torah, the Avdil, of course, this is Kodesh, you're allowed to ask not only what does the Pasuk mean, why is it placed where it's placed, why is it sandwiched between the Pasuk before and the Pasuk after it, you're allowed to ask why is it next to the Parashah before the Parashah after, you can ask any sort of question, that is going to be a good question. That's why most questions that are asked on the Parashah usually are uh, valid questions, you can get so technical. <clears throat> so the question then is what's the connection between Parashat Mishpatim and Parashat Terumah? As we learned last week, Parashat Mishpatim talks about the fiscal and social laws. It teaches us about the laws of uh, transacting in business, honesty in business, the laws of damages, uh, the laws of lending money, etc. Uh, Parashat Mishpatim is the basis of all the laws of honest business practice. The Torah is telling us that only after you study Parashat Mishpatim and your money is kosher money, then, only then can you approach Parashat Tirumah. Which means after the provisions of Parashat Mishpatim are observed, and your money now is clean money, that money will accept. Now we'll accept the donation. Unfortunately, there are a lot of misguided people that indulge in unscrupulous business practice and think that they're going to cleanse themselves by making a contribution to a charitable cause. You know, they think that uh, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a wash. You know, I stole some money, I uh, cheated, but I went to the yeshiva and I made a hefty donation, you know, uh, in honor of this and that, and uh, it'll uh, atone for the, uh, for the uh, you know, less than honest business dealings. It doesn't work like that. The Pazuk says, God cannot be bribed. What do you mean God cannot be bribed? Even when you give tzedakah, but if you're doing it to whitewash uh, a sin, it does not work as such. The Gemara gives an example of somebody that steals wheat. He goes to his friend's field with a sickle, he steals wheat. He grinds it, 
makes flour out of it, adds water, kneads the dough, gives it to his wife, his wife bakes it, Lichbod, Shabbat, Kodesh, like the baby's high, 12 halot. So they sit down on Shabbat meal with guests. Habotzi, Lechem, and the with all the kavanot of the Rashash. Basuk says, Ubotzei, Abirech, Mi'etz Hashem. The Pasuk says, En zeh bevarech ela bina'etz. This man is not considered somebody that blesses God. He is somebody that blasphemes God. Why? Because it's stolen hala. Even though he's got a big yabakar, even though he's doing it, with uh, just coming out of the mikveh, with all the ritual, doesn't matter. You stole food, this is not considered blessing God. And therefore the Torah comes and tells you, Parashat Mishpatim is the prerequisite before giving charity. First, you have to make sure that the money is kosher, then you can give it. I uh, truly believe that, although this is a great challenge you know, for a rabbi now to scrutinize not only his institution, but to scrutinize the donators. That each guy that comes with a check, you have to start now uh, running a, uh, you know, a check on the guy. You know, who is he? Is he Shabbat Shabbat? How do you earn the money? It's not so simple, you know, our, our yeshiva is an institution so strapped for money that, you know, wherever they can get it from, you know, they, you know if they uh, have deal, you know, if, if they can get a, uh, a grant from the Roman Catholic Church, uh, that's it, you know, that's what it is, they figure out what, you know, I think the Roman Catholic Church is what we're going to do, I guess part of it. Okay, I accept, I forgive, I forgive me for even saying something so stupid like that. In any event, you see that it's not so easy to turn away, take the furnishings that says ve'asita, ve'asita, and you shall make in the singular. When it comes to the aron, ve'asu aron. It's the only one that's read in the plurality. To teach us what? That when it comes to the aron, which symbolizes learning Torah, everybody must participate. Everybody must be a partner <laughs> in the study of Torah. Hence, it's not a personal endeavor. It's ve'asu. And therefore, whether you're sitting in the kolel studying 12 hours a day, or whether you're a businessman that's not able to study with such long hours, but you make it to the vinyana in the morning for a shi'ud and in the evening, or if you can't even do that once a day or several times a week, but no one could say that a Torah career or the study of Torah is not for me. And that is a very important facet of a synagogue. Synagogues are not just places of prayer. Primarily, they must be places of study, where communal learning sessions take place. Again, if the Torah tells you, when you build your synagogues in the future, make sure it has the same blueprint and same priority as the original. Hence, our synagogues, Baruch Hashem, have come a long way. The synagogues maybe 50, 60 years ago served a very limited capacity. Minyan. They printed a minyan schedule. If you had a first minyan, you're already considered a sophisticated synagogue. You know, you get already two minyan, you get an early minyan. And then they started to also become like uh, kiosks, giving out bagels for breakfast and some uh, cheese in order to lure the customers in, which was also okay. But you know, learning and the synagogue didn't have too much uh, to do with each other. You know, the rabbi would deliver a class, you know, an hour before uh, Minha on Shabbat afternoon. And, you know, uh, guys that uh, got into a fight with their wives, they got kicked out of the house, and they would go sit and, uh, you know, listen to the rabbi, fall asleep on the rabbi's speech. And uh, yeah, that, that was the extent. You had a couple of old men that would learn Zohar, you know, maybe after Shacharit. They would sit and read Zohar, but it wasn't known as a place of learning. Baruch Hashem, today we can be proud of ourselves that we've come a long way. Today all of us in the gods boast Torah centers. Uh, Torah centers become the primary uh, function of a synagogue. All of the synagogues actually there have schedules, not only of minyanim, of what classes they offer, what time, and which rabbis, both for men, for ladies, and children. Today, Baruch Hashem, the Aron, the Ark has become the central figure and furnishing of the synagogues. We would not think to build a synagogue today <coughs> without an expansive midrash. In the old days you built the midrash for the first minyan. Right. So the guys go pray first minyan in the midrash, not to bother the uh, original structure. Today, a midrash is primarily for shi'urim. 
We wouldn't think of building a synagogue today without a library. In the olden days, the library of the synagogue consisted of a thousand Sino Humashim and some, you know, Sidurim from David de Solo Pool, you know, from the Spanish Portuguese synagogue with the English and Hebrew. That was, that was considered a, uh, you know, an expansive library for a synagogue. Today, Baruch Hashem, uh, we wouldn't think of having a synagogue without volumes of Shas, Rishonim, Acharonim, sets of the Rambam, sets of the Shulchan Aruch, not one, three or four sets, in order that people could come and study. This is definitely uh, great strides that we have made in the Chen Ta'asu. We are modeling the original. The Mishkan also had a menorah. You okay, Rabbi Jumit? What's the symbolism uh, in the menorah? The menorah, of course, was the uh, the candelabra, we'll call it. We know it was made out of one solid piece of gold. It had kafturim and pirachim. Uh, yeah, cups, flowers. If you saw it, it was very, very intricate design. They were like little... Uh, uh, designed handiwork like little roses coming out of the menorah on the side of it, little cups beautiful, uh, but all made from one solid piece of course our rabbis tell us that the menorah symbolizes chinuch of our children the little flowers that come out of the menorah those are the offspring, those are the children the light of the menorah represents chinuch direction, after all if a person is in the dark the only way he can see him, see his way through is with light. And therefore, the light represents the education of what? Of those little kafturim and pirahim. Those little figurines that come out of the menorah. The synagogue is also a place where parents are able to educate their children. Just think. Where else do parents and children worship God together if not in the synagogue? How beautiful is it when a father comes and sits next to his son and is able to teach him how he's supposed to pray, how he's supposed to conduct himself. And the Torah is telling us that that's another central purpose of the synagogue. The synagogue becomes an institution where parents are able to bring their children in order to, uh, to expose them to our religion. Which is, where does a child get impacted from? The synagogue. Mm-hmm. He comes, he sees the structure, he sees the hachamim, he sees the sacred Torah. And therefore, although we might not have an official menorah, but it's, where's, where, where are we going to educate our children? On 42nd Street, Birmingham, in Times Square, in the, in the restaurants, in the movie theaters? Where are we going to give our children a Jewish education and environment? It's going to be in the synagogue. Yes, it's in the yeshivas, but we're not with them in the yeshivas. In the synagogue, the father's with his child and is able to give him the proper messages of Chinuch. You have the Mizbeach. The Mizbeach represented the altar sacrifice. Of course, every day in the Beit HaMikdash, there was countless number of Kurbanot that were brought. The Kurban Tamir in the morning, the Kurban Tamir in the afternoon. Uh, on Shabbat, they brought Kurban Musaf. On Rosh uh, Chodesh, they brought Kurban Musaf as well. The Mizbeach represents the self-sacrifice that a Jew has to have in religion. Now, I want to point out there's an important Midrash. The Midrash says when God told Moshe to build the Mishkan, Moshe Rabbeinu said impossible. How are we supposed to build a structure to contain you, God? After all, you're local artist How can you build a structure that can contain a God that is, that is everywhere? So God says, Moshe, you think I'm asking you to build the Mishkan according to my dimensions? I'm asking you to build it according to your dimensions. And the Hafez Haim learns from here that what God was telling Moshe is, I only expect for you to do as much as you can. <coughs> I don't ask you to do more than you're capable of doing. And therefore, it's obvious no human being can construct a, a, an infinite structure to house God. Build a, a structure according to your capacity, and once you do as far as you can go, I will rest on you. Now obviously that comes with a tremendous amount of sacrifice. Today we don't have a Mizmeah. We do not have an altar. But the Zohar says the Bima, where the Hazan stands, mm. that is considered a Mizmeah. You have to know that. Do you know that the grandfather of Rashi, 
used to go to the synagogue on Fridays. He had a long beard. Mm. And he used to go and sweep the bima with his beard. <coughs> so one rabbi heard say, it's not that he used his beard as a broom. He himself became a human broom. Which means to him it was the biggest kavod to... Just like the queen every morning would sweep the ashes off the Mizbeah, to the Mata Deshin, and as his grandfather would sweep it, and to him it was considered a, a big kavod. Why? Because to be Mazam Mizbeah. We don't have sacrifice today, but our prayers are sacrifice. Korbanot. Tefilat Shacharit is Korban Tamit Shil Shachar. Tefilat Mincha is Korban Tamit Shil Ben Arbaim. Tefilat Musaf is Korban Musaf. And where is that prayer sacrificed? On the Bima. And all the prayers of the Kahal, they go to the Bima, and on the Bima, they go up to Kadosh Baruch Hu. Uh, The next time you're solicited, uh, when you donate the Bima, the Bet Knesset, it's not a small solicitation. After the Hechal, which is the Aron, the Bima is the the most valuable uh, 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 piece in the the synagogue. After that is where the Korbanot are sacrificed. That's the the altar that the... um, uh, by the way, this is all patented goods over here. Any guys going to use my stuff here to collect money for another synagogue besides our synagogue is uh, you know, going to be held to the strictness of the law. Okay. In any event, 100%. These guys going to share this soon. They're going to use all my hadushim. They're going to raise $10 million tomorrow. And that's it. So we heard that from Mikey Franco. Yeah, he told us already. How are you guys already? Mikey's got a slot on the phone already. <laughs> <laughs> in any event, in any event, the tefilot, the bima, is considered the mizbeah. Hence, that becomes a central point in our synagogues. In the synagogue, you had the table. In the mishkan, you had the table, the shulchan. The shulchan is a very strange furnishing, unlike the aron, which is spiritual, unlike the menorah, which is spiritual, and unlike the mizbeah, which is spiritual, the shulchan is physical. In the sense that it has 12 showbread on it. I mean, this is the house of God. Obviously, God does not eat uh, bread. So what is the message of putting a shulchan in the, mizbe- in the Beit HaMikdash? The bread was changed weekly. Is every Shabbat, they would take the 12 loaves off. That was one of the Kohen's responsibilities. And you'd have to reset the table with fresh loaves. Now, you know, the Hadushim, they remained fresh all week. Even though there was no preservatives. Uh, they also remained piping hot, even though it wasn't on a heating tray. So these were one of the miracles that took place. But the point of the Shulchan is to teach us that even materialism, like bread, can be used L'Shem Shammai. In our religion, we don't believe there's a dichotomy between spiritual and physical. Even physical must be elevated to become metaphysical. And therefore, there is no such thing as a separation between Kodesh and Hol. Even Hol can be made Kodesh. For example, before Shabbat, don't we accept Shabbat a couple of minutes early? It's Friday afternoon. Jewish people have the ability to make from Friday afternoon Shabbat Kodesh. Saturday night, we're able to take Hol and make it Shabbat. We extend the Shabbat. That's a very important Jewish principle. We're able to take a meal, like we did the other night, where we're eating good food, uh, drinking the expensive wine, and uh, enjoying ourselves, and then get up and say some Devre Torah, and words of encouragement, and that meal now becomes mitzvah. It becomes Kodesh. It becomes a, a holy celebration. Just like our sleeping can also be sanctified. When a fellow sleeps, in order to regain some energy to serve God, that sleeping is a mitzvah. So the table in the Beit HaMikdash signifies a very important message. That even your bread is part of the service of God. Even your physical, even your materialism must be channeled for God. I once heard a nice hadush. I'm not implying that what we said now is not nice hadushim. Okay, another, another nice hadush. Shohan Aruch begins with a comment 
that the Ramah quotes from Harambam. Shiviti Adonai Lenegdi Tamid. Which means what? You must have God in front of you always. The first section of Shulchan Aruch ends with the laws of Purim. The last line in the laws of Purim, mm-hmm. the Ramah quotes a pasuk from Mishle that says, V'tov lev Mishle Tamid. The Shulchan Aruch opens up with the word Tamid and ends with the word Tamid. The first line of the Shulchan Aruch says, you always have to have God in front of you. That might be referring to what? When you're serving God. When you're praying. Mm-hmm. When you're uh, uh, involved in ritual. When you're involved in ceremony. You have to do with Hashem Shamayim. The end of Shohan Aruch tells you what? V'tov lev mishteh tamid. Even when you're reveling. Even when you're partying. Even when you're enjoying yourself. Tamid. It's got to be Shemit Hashem Tamid also. Which means God has to be at every facet of your life. And that's the message of the Shulchan. Our Torah does not demand us to be angels. The Torah demands us to be human beings. The Katsuke Rebbe once said on the Pasuk, Ve'anche Kodesh Te'yunni. It says you have to be men of holiness. So the Katsuke Rebbe said, first you have to be human. You have to be Anche. God wants you to be humanly holy. God, God doesn't want you to be angels. God has enough angels in the heaven. And therefore the Torah is telling you, you got to eat, you have to sleep, you got to get married, you have to, you cannot deny yourself from all the physical things in life. First you have to be anche, but what? Anche Kodesh. Be humanly holy. That being said, the Pasuk writes, Bechol derachecha da'ehu. Know God in all your ways. Like the Mishnah says, Bechol ma'asecha yiyu l'shem shamayim. All your deeds should be l'shem shamayim. Even your personal. In a synagogue, we also have a shulchan. Uh, most of our synagogues, as I mentioned, uh, offer different se'udot from time to time. Of course, all our synagogues provide se'udah shilishit. We come to synagogue, and we eat. Now all our synagogues provide catered meals for se'udah shilishit. With tuna fish, and all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, desserts, and drinks. And the lesson of the attendee to the synagogue is, yes, even eating. Even eating is done for the sake of God. It's quite common that in the morning our synagogues provide us breakfast. And we have many affairs in our synagogues as well. We have some of the most lavish, sumptuous meals at a Saudat Brit Milah. Or a Saudat Pidyon Ben. Or a Saudat Hatan de Kala. The synagogue, if you think about it, how many meals a year do you eat in shul? It's a significant amount. We go to shul for weddings and parties. Yeah, how many breakfasts did you have in shul this year? How many dinners did you have in shul this year? It's a significant amount. You know, how much poundage have been indigested in synagogues? And what does that teach you? That even the shulchan is Kodesh. Even your eating is all. So a synagogue has to serve in that capacity as well. To convey a message of materialism can be sanctified for mitzvot. What do our rabbis tell us? Make sure you go inside and get something from the Suda Brit Milah. Whatever, make sure you eat something. Make sure you take something. This is an important Suda. Don't leave the building without going to get a Danish or get a cup of coffee or something. If our synagogues are built with that model, we have hope. If the Aron, if the Torah center is the main function, if the Menorah, which represents Chinuch, is being followed in the synagogue, that our children, the little kaftorim and pirahim, are being illuminated by their parents as they bring them to the synagogue. That might be also a, an allusion to the youth minyanim that we have for them. If our prayers are accepted on the Mizbaya, when we have the bima, and a, a synagogue has daily minyanim, where people are able to come and pray according to their, uh, according to their custom, and the synagogue also teaches us the lesson of the shulchan, then it is a legitimate synagogue. But if it's missing any of these components, it's, it's faulty. Imagine building a Mishkan without an Aron. Doesn't count. Doesn't work. Or let's say, you know, the Mishkan's great, just one item we're missing, back order. There's a back order on the Menorah. There is a back order on the Menorah. Back order on the Menorah, put, put the Mishkan in Geniza. Unless all these pieces are there, the Mishkan is non-functional. Hence, we must make sure that our synagogues are providing the attitudes that are represented by these pieces. That being said, one of the uh, 
pieces of the Mishkan, actually the walls of the Mishkan, were made from Atse Shittim. I think they're called Atse Shittim Acacia wood. It's a very, very strong, solid wood. And very tall. Uh, ten Amot. Ten Amot would be something like 15 to 20 feet tall. That served as the walls on three sides of the Mishkan. They're planks or boards. So the Gemara asks, the Mishkan was built in the Midbar. Where did they get Aser Shittim? Uh, they didn't have uh, Home Depot in the Midbar. Yeah, they didn't have any of these uh, lumber yards to go get wood. Where did they get the Aser Shittim? So the Gemara, as like he says, was planted. Was planted. But it wasn't stab planted. It was planted by Abraham Abid. Which is Abraham Abinu in his Nivuah predicted there's going to need to be a need for a Mishkan. He predicted the need for acacia wood. So what did he do? He went himself. And you wouldn't expect Abraham Abinu to be involved in such a thing yet. But the Pazu says he planted a tree. And Stam, it wasn't Arbor Day. He wasn't, uh, Abraham Abinu didn't uh, work for the JNF. Uh, you know, Abraham Abinu was planting a tree with Kavanot in order to build. The Mishkan. The only problem is he built it in Be'er Sheva. A few weeks ago we were in Be'er Sheva. Uh, we had lunch in Be'er Sheva. You see the pictures over there. Uh, we didn't see the, uh, the orchard of Abraham Abinu while we were there. Because it's not there anymore. Because somebody took the trees of Abraham and transported it to Egypt. Who was that? Yaakov Abinu. When Yaakov Abinu went down to Egypt, after he heard that his son Yosef was still alive, he said, hold it. The Jews are going to need these trees in the Midbar. In 200 years from now, they're going to leave Egypt, they're going to leave these trees. So, I, I can't imagine this. Here he just hears his son has just been revealed. What does he say? Take me to Be'er Sheva. What are you doing to Be'er Sheva? Nah? We're going to go on a, uh, a, a, a tree cutting expedition. We're talking about tree cutting expedition. We're going to go now. We're going to go We're going to go now. We're going to go now. We're going to see Yosef. Bring the, uh, bring the axes. He goes, he cuts down all the trees, and brings them down to Egypt. I can imagine the reaction of Yosef. Dad, what are you doing over here? What are you doing with all this wood over here? It's got a whole uh, truck of, of lumber. We have wood in Egypt. Oh, no, 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 this, this is not stab wood. This is wood that was planted by your great-grandfather, Abraham Abinu. What are we going to do with it? Just do me a favor. When your great-great-great-grandchildren come out of Egypt, make sure you take this stuff with you, because one day you're going to need it. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, 200 years later, when the Jews came out of Egypt, what are they doing? They're carrying the wood. Each tribe is carrying a log with them outside of Egypt. They don't know exactly what, when, but if their grandfather told them they're going to need the wood, they don't you take the wood. Sure enough, when the commandment came, make Atsishitim, huh? we are in Dijande, we got Atsishitim, beautiful, I'm a Biru, but again, you learn a great lesson from over here. And we, we mentioned this a few weeks ago, and it's important to have to drill this in our head. And I'm starting, as I get a little older, I start to understand how smart Acham Baruch Alav Shalom was. Acham Baruch always, in every speech that he made, you'd always hear the word, the tradition of our father, the tradition of our community. He was very, very strong on that one point it was, it, 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 it would, if, he, if he spoke for more than five minutes that comes out somewhere in the speech the minhag, the tradition and I always wondered why is that the rabbi's focus and you, you get to always up to real because that's everything you want to build that mishkan that's what I was telling you don't think the religion starts by you don't think that your success and your prosperity and your goodness is from you. The Mishkan must be built in the spirit of your great, 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 great grandfather. Abraham Abinu's hands must be at the foundation of this Mishkan. And therefore, you can't just get any wood. It's got to be wood that Abraham planted. It's got to be wood that Yaakov Abinu transported. It's got to be wood that the Shabbatim took out in Mishnayim. That must be the basis of the synagogue. And that's true to all our synagogues. Today, we build our synagogues on the most beautiful uh, brick, from the most ornate marble. We have the fanciest rugs, 
columns and beams. Granted, it's not wasn't planted from our uh, ancestors, maybe in Halab or in the other Middle Eastern countries. But that being said, the message is the synagogue must be true to its predecessors. Once the synagogue starts to change, once the synagogue starts to veer away from the tradition of its predecessors, of its founding fathers, then already that synagogue, Hasbe Shalom, is now in contempt of tradition. And there's no bigger sin that when Jewish people veer away, because that's the way, that's how conservative starts, that's how reform starts. This is for the opinion uh, page now of the class. Yeah. Take this with a grain of salt. This is just one man. You know, I guess I got to spend now. Yeah. This is one man's opinion. Uh, what I'm going to tell you now. Yeah, this is uh, the the views here do not represent. Uh, you know, ah, here's a Taurus. Yeah, we tape it. I'm not scared. It comes out of my mouth, Jerry. I tape. I'm not, I'm not scared. They're going to misquote me anyway. So what's the difference? I'm not going to say it. After proving to you the importance and centrality of the synagogue, how important it is, what it represents, we know what the synagogue has done for us here in Brooklyn. As many synagogues as we have, Ken Yirbu, Baruch Hashem, they're providing us with the learning of Torah, they're providing us a place where our children can come and get in a positive environment to see exactly what we're all about. Our synagogues are filled with minyanim from early in the morning to late at night. Our synagogues are teaching us the importance of channeling materialism like the Shulchan towards God. And Baruch Hashem, our synagogues are built all with the tradition. All our synagogues have the plaque not to accept converts. No synagogue would ever dream to take that plaque off its wall and change it. Because that was the tradition. Not by Yaakov Abinu, but by Hakam Yaakov Kasim. None of us would even dream to start doing something different in constructing it with a lady section that might not be 100% kasher according to the halakha. Nobody would dream to start uh, changing the style of Sefer Torah that we use. Baruch Hashem, it's, it's loyal, it's true to the tradition. And Baruch Hashem, it's serving its purposes. Our synagogues are all filled. Uh, if we build six more synagogues, they'd also be filled with people that are all coming with thirst to come and benefit from these places. Then our community moved as a summer resort to deal New Jersey. I want to tell you something. Uh, in a resort, it's very dangerous. Because the mindset of people in a resort area is much different than the mindset in their in their home. In their home there's seriousness. In their home there's a certain amount of responsibility. There's a certain amount of obligation. At home there's conscious. On vacation there's what's called pirikat ol. Which means leave me alone. It means once you get there you, 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 you come to 105 and that is no toll anymore. Free toll. They charge you twice on the way back. They don't tell you that. Anyway... So now what happens, you get there and uh, leave me alone. Baruch Hashem, our rabbis were so smart, and they had a great challenge. And I, it was a daunting challenge. How do you create from a resort area a makom Torah? Which is now, you not only have to transform the place, you have to trans, trans, <coughs> transform the mindset of people that are going to vacate. They're not going to... Uh, at Baruch Hashem, the rabbis there, in... in, in Fighting great battles, hit them out to, to some of the greatest battles that were fought in our community, pressed, and Baruch Hashem today, we have Kolelim, we have synagogues every three blocks, and you can walk down over there, and I'm not telling you that uh, deal is uh, by no sense of the, uh, uh, you know, the measure, nobody should misinterpret me, but there's Benet Torah there. Uh, you'll see Avrechim walking. Our children have a place to go if they want to learn after camp. All the synagogues have a host of class. This is 
If the synagogue doesn't have clans, it doesn't exist. And before the summer, we get our old male, and this clan, that clan, this time, ladies, this, and it. Baruch Hashem, with, with, with a great challenge, the rabbis in that vacation town made it a place where it's profitable for Jews to exist. They have, if you go to Shulat Tishadeav, in any of the synagogues in the community, jammed. Uh, that's a tremendous success. Not that people are fasting, but they're fasting on, in, in, in a resort. That's that. Different head. Three, 30 feet from the beach and from pools and tennis courts to be fasting, that's a great, great challenge. Baruch Hashem, the community did not unravel. Now, I'm not saying we don't have problems. There's problems. But it's possible to exist in a religious atmosphere. Then the community now is involved in another state of its uh, evolution process. We have now began a new resort area, and I'm no stranger to this resort area, and that's how I know firsthand what I'm talking about. That's in Florida. Baruch Hashem, our members are purchasing homes, townhouses, apartments <coughs> in, in the region. Now, some smart people, visionaries, understood that, again, without infrastructure, without, without a synagogue, you'll have members of our community that are going to go to these places with a resort mentality. Finish. The community will unravel. The community will just... And you're in Florida, in a place that's outside of the fold. Who knows what can do? So they built the synagogue. But unfortunately, unfortunately... Where we're all very proud. Oh, we have a synagogue, a synagogue, we have a synagogue. We must analyze that this resort area is not just for old people anymore. This resort area is for all ages. Our children are going to this place two, three times a year on vacation. Our children are there for holidays. Our children find themselves there now that every, you know, if you have two hours off, eh, we'll go to Florida for a couple of hours and we'll come back, uh, you know, we'll be back uh, the next night. Which means now already it's become a community. It's not, used to be, guys, 80 years old, they retire, they send them off to Florida. And there's a God's waiting room. But now, but now, now we're, now we're ready, now we're ready, uh, it's become a resort area for everybody. And Hashim, Hashim, the top of all ages. And this is very dangerous. Because if the infrastructure is not there, if our children do not have a place to study, which our children are there 10, 15, 20 days a year, it's possible. If a person goes for holidays, if a person goes for intercession, if a person goes for weekends, a, per- a-, a child now wants to study. Where, where do you go? We're going to go to the synagogue? Well, the synagogue, Baruch Hashem, we have Minyani. I want, I want to have a class. Uh, I want to get books. I want to have a, yeah, yeah, books. I got to go. What's going on over here? It's very dangerous. You need an Aron. You need learning. Now, of course, the attitude will be of some regular guy. Uh, now, nah, I'm going on vacation. I want to see some black cat now walking down, uh, you, know, uh, you know, country club uh, drive. Now, leave me alone. Now, There's enough that we have to see them on the Avenue you are now. I got to go now. I want to see some, some guy with dandruff on his uh, black suit walking around, uh, you know, Aventura. Leave me alone now. I'm on vacation. You're right. But you know what? As uncomfortable as it is for some people, that's what saved the community here. And it, it, it keeps you under a certain... Framework, you know, you can't go wild. There's a certain, and even the guy on the fringe, yeah, yeah, it, it brings a conscience to these places. Don't you understand? You need to have a conscience because once you get off that jetway, that's it. Leave me alone. I'm here now. You know, that's it. I'm on, I'm on vacation. Don't bother me with any of this stuff over here. Now that being said, there's another challenge that we're faced against. The synagogue is supposed to be a place of Hindu for our children. Baruch Hashem, our community has a very high standard. We don't realize, you only realize the high standard of our community when you go see other communities. Where we're living in Florida, we're not the only community there. There are other communities that come from different parts of the world. South America, etc. They have different standards. They were not brought up with the same uh, rigid uh, hinuch that all of us had. And therefore, unfortunately, 
possible and happening, ladies will walk into the synagogue and show with a pocketbook. Now, where we come from, a pocketbook in Shul and Shabbat? What are you talking about? If a lady would walk into Shari Siyon or Hayas with a pocketbook on Shabbat, the looks that they would get from the fellow members, finish Gal Gashil Hatzamorot, she turned into a, to, to, to a pile of bones. What are you talking about? A pocketbook in Shul, this is considered to us. Uh, Roll over the balcony. Can't you say it? Can't you say it? With a pocketbook. Who brings that? But again, in other communities, well, you bring a pocketbook. Now you gotta be careful. Now, ready? Yeah, now the ladies come, there's a pocketbook. Oh, it's not I bring a pocketbook. No, just a mirror. Just the tissues, Kleenex. But this has changed. Don't you understand? Now, the sudden, becomes a, a thing of pocketbook. And now you bring a, a lipstick, and you bring a this, and bring a that. It's very dangerous. Hey, Tama, Rabbi, you're an alarmist. This is what you're, this is what you're driving us crazy about? And what about if in the synagogue, in the middle of uh, the Sefer Torah, somebody's cell phone goes off? Would we ever have in our synagogues here a cell phone go off in the middle of services? A Shabbat? History never... Lo hayav lo And if a guy had a cell phone go off, the service committee would take the guy, throw the guy out. Are you sitting in synagogue? With a, with a, with a, we know people what they do in their homes maybe, but in the synagogue? Unfortunately, since there's now... Diversity. <laughs> we're sitting and we're praying. Cell phones are going off. There was a movement to even bring valet parking on the holiday. Which is, it shows there's a different... There's diversity here. There's di- now if we don't lock this in, if we don't solidify... What, is it possible? Is it possible? That ladies are going to this vacation spot and there is no mikveh. How is it possible? Unless you tell me there's a certain sigula that in Fort Lauderdale there's no such thing as nida, the ladies don't become nida, and maybe it's a sigula. But according to my knowledge, people become nida. What does a lady do on Friday night? What does a lady do on the holidays? Here, Baruch Hashem, we have infrastructure. There, you have ladies jumping <coughs> off the balcony into the intercoastal. Yeah. So I say this is cashier. It's not believable. No, we're going to go in the pool. It's not believable. In the two in the morning over there, in the, you know, uh, the place yeah. over yeah. here. Where, yeah. What are you talking about over here? There's not yeah. stuff that we wouldn't dream of doing outside the fold over here. Craziness, which means the whole structure is now starting to come apart. And what about people? I mean, they buy an apartment on the thirty seventh floor. After they buy a power on the 37th floor, they say, oh, how are we going to get up there on Shabbat? Oh, you didn't think of that, to pitch? How would you think? You, don't, you, don't, you, know, you, 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 you know you don't have wings. That you know already. You knew you didn't have wings before you bought the apartment. And you knew you can't, you're not Spider-Man. You knew that also. <laughs> so, you can't so, scale the wall. You can't scale the wall. So what were you thinking? And you know that you're a, you're a, a quasi Shomer Shabbat. So what were you thinking? In a lot, we're on vacation. Get the apartment, and then we'll, uh, whatever everybody else does. If I have to take an elevator, push a button, what am I going to do? I, don't know. Well, I shouldn't. Do, I should be homebound. So yeah, push a button. So we went to put. Shall I say things that we wouldn't dream of? Now people are going. Eh, one vacation, leave me alone. No conscience, free for all. People are now walking into buildings. They only have street their doors, electric doors. Eh, so you walk in. What are you do? So now already Shabbat became, what are you going to do? If, if, if there's no other option, you may Shabbat. Shabbat, what's going on over here? Things that, well, in, 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 if we would be sitting at home, and you had to make an important phone call, you would say, I have to make a phone call, what could you do? We would never dream. But all of a sudden you get to Florida. Why? Because it's not only you, there's a thousand people with the same head. And therefore, when everybody's in a loose head, you see this, you see this guy coming along, when you're coming out of shul, jogging around the golf course, and uh, this guy over here is in his bathing suit going out to the pool. So that's Shabbat. So therefore you say, well, I'm, I'm a Sadiq. All I'm doing is what? Walking into a screen door. I'm, I'm, I'm the good guy. What's going on over here? What's going on over here? What's going on over here? Very dangerous situation. I'm, 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 I'm talking about the trend that can happen. Because, you know, when a guy goes on vacation, it's always dangerous. But till now, a guy went on vacation, you all have to worry about your own family. Now, now it's a community going on a vacation. It's no longer one, two families that have to protect themselves. Now it's a community that's traveling. When a community travels, we have to be careful that if the infrastructure is not there, to make sure that it's not uh, subject to pirikat all, if the atmosphere is not strong, this is like a, uh, is like a bird flu. 
you know, you have the birds in, in, in China that migrate, and they come to Europe, and then from Europe they migrate to America, and then you have a pandemic. It's only two and a half hours from South Florida to New York. If these permissive attitudes start to prevail and start to come back, then Shema Yisrael, then you have a pandemic in our community. And therefore, I'm not giving solutions yet. But I'm just telling you the State of the Union that the way I see it, unfortunately, uh, we could boast that we have a synagogue. But that's, that's about it. Uh, more than that, we need an Aron, we need a Menorah, we need a Shulchan. The services must be conducted according to our strict tradition. No such thing over here as pocketbooks and cell phones. This is intolerable. And we must be very, very careful because if, if some mikvaot must be built, kolelim have to be built. I'm sorry to tell you, as much as you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't appreciate it, but your children are going to go to Florida six times a year. Eventually, you don't want your children to learn. Where are you going to send them to learn? No, there's no learning in Florida. We're off. If they go to deal, there's ten shuls they can go study in. There's rabbis. There's you could talk to somebody. This has to be done. And Hashem, that's what it means in the Pasuk is Tasu. When you build your communities, you must build it in the spirit of the Mishkan. And if any of the furnishings are missing, you're in trouble. And Bahazat Hashem, if we as a community take this uh, seriously and make the proper again, nobody wants to be hey Rabbi, you spoiled our vacation, you killed it. Now we gotta find a new spot now. All right, the Turnberry's come out now the black has to go over Turnberry. Now we gotta go find another place off the beaten to track. So the uh, so these uh, you know, the, uh, they found it already. Right? Set up already. Right? Set up shop ready. Right, they got infiltrated already. And you, you can't escape God, gentlemen. Uh, you have to take uh, God on the uh, vacation itself. Uh, it's more than a vacation. It's become residency. One day people can end up living in Florida all year round, probably. And therefore, it's got to be discussed in the inception. And we're too late already. But something has to be done in order to ensure that our community remains uh, devout and loyal to its traditions. That's what it means when it says the synagogue has to have the word of Yaakov Abinu. It has to have the word of Abraham Abinu. As long as it has the foundations of our ancestors, there's room. But when it's new wood, and it's new ideas, and modernism, and newfangled values, then already there's something to be concerned about.